Đây là Coi 68 và bạn đang nghe DeFi Discussion. Okay, welcome back to another episode of DeFi Discussion and this is going to be a very special uh, episode because this is the first time that we do it in English and um, for this very special uh, episode we also have with us today a very special guest so hello xin chào anh uh, nam maybe say hi to our audience and uh, a little introduction about yourself hi xin chào các bạn tôi tên là nam <laughs> nhưng mà tôi là người việt kiều thì là nói không tiếng việt hơi tốt lắm thì uh, bây giờ lại nói có lại nói tiếng anh yes my name is nam i am vietnamese i grew up in berlin uh, i live in new york now Um, I am one of the co-founders of the project called Hyperlane. We're doing interoperability uh, across many different blockchains. And yeah, currently on my uh, Asia trip number one uh, in Seoul right now for KBW. Um, we'll stop by in Vietnam as well. Um, currently stranded a bit in Seoul after the Typhoon Yagi, and then I'll be at Singapore as well. But yeah, super excited to get a bit more exposure to Asia again. Mm, yeah, I'm uh, Berlin. I'm Berlin. Okay, now yeah. Uh, hopefully that we uh, will have an uh, a founder mode for this episode. And uh, so you currently based in the US and just flew back to Asia uh, for a couple of events uh, this week and uh, in Vietnam, sp- and to be specific, next week, right? But from your perspectives, from your experience, what are three key difference that you can see between the crypto web3 builders community in the us and the builders community in asia yeah it's interesting because part of the reason why i'm here is because i don't know much about the builder community in asia um and so you know i'll caveat these statements with these being mostly like either like hypotheses or like secondhand opinions um from third parties Um, But I think the biggest difference that probably comes to my mind is that builders in Asia have a much more hands-on experience, either because they themselves or because their users which surround them, like their local market, is like actually into crypto, right? Like I think it's very common for builders in the US to kind of write like be in crypto or maybe have some friends who are in crypto, but like most of their kind of like social, like, you know, like friends and families uh, from, let's say, school, uh, they won't have any exposure to crypto other than like occasionally holding um, some assets versus I get the sense that people in Asia, uh, but also in general, I guess, in the more developing world, um, although I don't even know if that's a good term anymore, um, have kind of direct exposure to crypto because they're using it. They have like an actual like real world problem that is being solved by crypto. And so I think that's kind of like I suspect that's a big difference for builders in Asia. I think the second thing is just everything is just like bigger scale, you know, like I obviously live in New York, it's a big city, but um, I do think like Asian cities kind of like take it to the next level. And I think, you know, I was uh, in India before and just everything is just like, you know, it's just like there's more developers, there's just more going on all the time. And so I think that's another interesting point. And then maybe the last one, I feel, um, I don't know if that's maybe a little bit the like language barrier in the sense that I suspect that like many folks in um, Asia maybe have like slightly less accessibility to English. Like I definitely noticed that here and like all previously uh, when I was in Vietnam as well. And it's not even that they're like weaker. I think maybe sometimes it's just like the, um, you know, like in-person like verbal communication is harder. But like once you get actually to a level where you're comfortable, like you can kind of tell that like people know this stuff here. Mm. Uh, and so I think just that kind of like that kind of like it's much harder, I would say, to kind of like quickly gauge whether somebody knows this stuff uh, here just because of the different language barrier. But like once you get to know people, it's like, yeah, super awesome to see mm. um, just like how sophisticated builders um, are here in Asia. And I think that's part of the reason why I'm here because I want to just like talk to more builders and kind of like see how they see uh, the industry because also right like there's another kind of like segmentation of like things crypto people in the West tend to like kind of care about or think about seems to be very different from like what 
people, let's say, in Asia think about. Yeah, uh, hope that you can uh, uh, know more about the um, Asian community, especially you have the meetup on 10th September next week, right? Uh, so uh, anyone who wants to uh, register or join the Hyperland uh, meetup can uh, Maybe you can find the information pasted in the description of this podcast. So hopefully that you can come and uh, communicate more with the Hyperlane team and then uh, we can uh, discover many new great things. Okay, so let's talk about a very trending keyword right now, uh, which is restaking and uh, somehow Eigenlayer, a very uh, popular project. Um, Eigenlayer has announced a lot of Uh, updates and new features in the past few weeks. But as an AVS build on top of Eigen Layer, uh, what update from this base layer that you care most about and uh, you, you think that it has the most impact on the core product structure of Hyperlane? Yeah, I think, you know, we've been, um, I would argue, day one builders on top of like Eigen Layer or like the concept of economic security and like the use of like, uh, yeah, like kind of like idle assets like. Uh, Take Eve to do so, um, and I think honestly the biggest thing as a, like speaking at least as a developer is always going to be um, you know like uh, the stability of APIs, like the predictability of the roadmap, um, and I think you know like we're so in the early days of thinking about hey how do we build like this kind of generalized restaking system or, like Eigen Layers in the early days of it uh, or Eigen Layer and other people that it definitely is kind of inevitable that some of like yeah some changes and some friction kind of like is generated at that level um but that's definitely the kind of like the biggest thing that i would say that i care about right so like i think even some of the features let's say like using any assets or like being able to do awards now as an avs and hopefully slashing i think there's just like a lot of these kind of like building blocks that need to exist and it will be interesting to see how eigenlayer and um Other folks like Symbiotic at Carrick uh, will be able to kind of provide a good developer platform for folks like us to actually build. Hmm. Okay. So um, I just read a few keynotes from your docs uh, before this podcast and uh, discovered that uh, Hyperland has its own validator network and also the IS ISM, the module uh, for security. Um, so why does Hyperland integrate uh, AVS solutions after you have a uh, have your own security network. So does it add more uh, complex layer on your verification system, or uh, did you have any reason behind uh, this setup? Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to go into it. Uh, you know, like stop me if I'm going too much into the weeds or if I'm like glossing over things. But you know, the pre like maybe to like take the step back and ask like what is the problem that Hyperlane is trying to solve, right? It's, it's trying to solve uh, the bridging problem, which is basically a specialized subset of the general Oracle problem, right? Like if you are a smart contract on some chain, like how do you know that something happened on a different chain? Uh, and so there's a bunch of like, you know, like transport layer and like uh, kind of like general infrastructure considerations, but the key part about interoperability is basically this kind of verification mechanism, right? Like how do you know that something happened And what are the trust assumptions that you have to take on to know that that happened? And so we early on realized that there's no such thing as a singular answer. Like it's ultimately always going to be a, like a trade-off that an application leveraging interoperability has to kind of like choose between cost, security, latency, um, complexity. Uh, and so we built kind of what we call the ISM abstraction interchain security modules, which basically allow developers to pick from like you get different points on the spectrum, right? And that can be like typically, right? A lot of interoperability today are still like proof of authority uh, value sets, right? So basically the idea that like, hey, there's these three entities that like observe some origin chain. And if they um, agree, then that's something that the destination chain contract will accept as sufficient verification. But there's also roller bridges, there is light clients, there's ZK light clients. Uh, and so we believe that like these are ultimately like we call them sometimes like Legos that like application developers can compose to kind of like build the right trade-off for their application. And one of the things that we've always been again very excited about, we've talked with Eigenlayer about this like uh, like 
since like end of 22 at this point. But um, is how can you use economic security to like generate a better trade-off? Uh, and I think what's interesting is that economic security you can think of basically as like uh, economic secured validators, you can think of a way to basically take a slower but more secure ISM that's called like a light client and basically gain most of their benefits uh, without like typically the cost or the latency involved and the usage of such an ISM. And so I think that's what's a really like truly innovative thing about like again like re the concept of restaking this, and that's why we've kind of like started working on yeah the AVS and other related infrastructure to basically ultimately enable application developers to create better trade offs uh, for the verification of their messages. Mm. So is there any conflict? I mean, um, between the uh, security value of uh, your, I, I just say your own um, network and uh, the ETH value, does it conflict or, um, I mean, if people use the Ethereum value to secure your network, does it conflict with the value capture for your network? Um, I mean, I would say we're probably in the early days of, you know, like really understanding, right? Like not only like, yeah, like what are maybe the like conflicts of interest, let's say, uh, but also in terms of, right, like the risks of like actually, let's say, restaking across many AVSs and like, right, like uh, there's, I think, some interesting papers around uh, the kind of cascading effects of that kind of risk. Um, actually, also one more thing I want to say is that there's no such thing as kind of like a, um, you know, like hyperlane validator network like uh validators are run on a per origin chain basis anybody can run them there's no permissioning involved there uh and then again applications can choose whatever validators they want to run right and so basically think of like if you think like of like in the base like the simplified version like think of basically like hyperlane as like a marketplace for validators to offer their services and applications choosing from them uh the use of like yeah restaking protocols like abs is allow you to uh, basically allow validators to basically like compete by bringing like economic weight to the attestations, right? Like basically like, it's one thing to say like, hey, like I'm Nam and like I'm running this validator, right? And like, you should trust me because I'm Nam and like, you know who I am, but like I could lie and there's no consequence, right? Like all I lose is my reputation. However, if you use economic security, right? And I have basically like, let's say a million restaked ETH behind my attestation, then like an application can look at right like my attestation and know okay cool like if nam ever lies he will lose a million bucks and so i think that makes it uh much more compelling for like hyperlane validators right to like i think compete but ultimately it makes it easier to have better security for applications mm, uh, so um that's a security part last week uh, the cctv the protocol of circle they uh, discover a mint bug and uh, we also experience a lot of exploits and hacks uh, in the past um, for the bridging protocols and uh, we know that security is a very special um, it's, it's like a top priority for uh, bridging protocols uh, but how can you ensure that security part without sacrificing other aspects like uh, permissionless or uh, scalability? Yeah, I, it's a, you know, uh, it's a tricky question in the sense that there's no right answer, right? Like, I think we've had, right, like, it's basically, again, like a specialized version of the general question of, like, smart contracts, right? Like, it's nice that, like, anybody can deploy smart contracts on Ethereum, but, right, like, is everybody able to? Like, what uh, mechanisms do we have to know how good smart contracts are? Uh, but I think it's true that, or like, I think to your point, uh, bridging is a space where this is especially, um, I guess, uh, the surface area can be catastrophic because oftentimes interoperability protocols hold like a very large amount of collateral that can be basically like uh, withdrawn. Um, and so I think, you know, like, how do you solve it? Like, I don't think there's a single silver bullet that will solve it, but um, I do think one of the things is just like the same way we've been able to, right? Like now when you sign transactions, there's like a bunch of services that help you understand the transaction. There's a bunch of services like that help you like, uh, right? Like gain the reputation of addresses. 
And so I'm expecting that like bridging will uh, need to go through that same cycle of just like infrastructure and services that basically make it easier and more accessible, more understandable so that developers have an easier time either in our ability developers have an easier time building more secure protocols, but also application developers have an easier time understanding the risk of using these protocols. Um, and I think one way that I expect Hyperlane to be able to contribute on that front is that uh, it's ultimately like, uh, like I view it as the most open um, interoperability protocol. And so like different uh, parties can come together to basically uh, share, share the surface area versus like everybody having to reinvent it. And so therefore like leaving a light higher chance of bugs. Right, like I think that's the ultimate open source ethos. That's right, like how a lot of like critical projects like Linux and OpenSSL and and browser engines run. And I think there's no way around that that has to happen. And so I'm very proud of the people who've been working on Hyperlane, kind of like taking that ethos and applying it in interoperability as well. So uh, we, we're going to move to, I think this is a very uh, serious problem and it's uh, it's become more and more a serious problem right now, uh, which is the liquidity fragmentation uh, for, uh, it, because right now we have a lot of chains, right? Uh, a lot of rollups. Um, uh, people can easily uh, deploy a new chain with, with just a few clicks. And we're also seeing a lot of fancy words right now on X. Uh, like chain abstraction, people develop a lot of new token standards. So from, from your point of view, what differentiate the solutions of Hyperland on this issue? Yeah, I think, you know, I like maybe to the pr uh, previous point, um, I think to accomplish something like chain abstraction, uh, and I think there's many, I think there's many different, uh, like kind of great primers on, right, like how this is being accomplished. But I think everybody generally recognizes that like, uh, it's gonna have to be a bunch of different primitives coming together to kind of like form this chain abstraction um, stack. Like I think especially Everclear has spent obviously a lot of great time and has produced a lot of great content to kind of convey that point. Um, but yeah, like uh, basically like we need people to be able to focus on what they are like uniquely good at. Um, and yeah, I would say that uh, again, like I think a open and permissionless like uh, uh, like message bridge or like all in chain abstraction term settlement layer, uh, I think is key uh, to accomplish chain abstraction. And yeah, I'm super proud of like folks like Everclear or like the fact that Ever folks like Everclear and Kalani have chosen to use Hyperlane, I think speaks volumes to this kind of idea that like any component it builds on top of the like lower end of the stack, to, like wants to know that like, you know, like if like Abacus works the company that I'm like uh, employed at. Like if that ever goes away, like um, like folks can easily like deploy and run Hyperlane themselves, um, and you can only do that with a again credible open source uh, framework for interoperability, which is what we're building with Hyperlane. Yeah. Um, so we see a lot of um, messaging protocol. Uh, at this current stage, namely layer zero, wormhole. So if you have to choose one word to describe your advantage over other competitors, uh, such, such as those projects, uh, what will that word be? You know, if you don't mind, can I ask you what you think that is? Because uh, I'm kind of, you know, doing some market research here, like from what you've been able to gather on our website or from like just, I guess, normal crypto Twitter, let's say. How do you see Hyperlane uh, to be different from these right now? And no, like no wrong answers. Again, I'm just kind of curious what your perception has been. I, I think I come across uh, the most, um, I think it's permissionless since layer zero, if they want to, um, if, if you want to deploy a new chain on, uh, let's say layer zero, um, you have to ask, ask the team for the chain ID, right? Right, so if, if they decide to, Okay, if they say, okay, you cannot uh, get that chain ID and then we give that chain ID to another uh, teams, uh, another chains. Uh, so, so you cannot decide on that. But I think Hyperland has rather that permissionless stuff. Yeah, that's, that, that's, my, that's, that's my point of view on this. Yeah, yeah, I think you're on the money. <laughs> I think you're on the money. Like that's definitely, 
uh, what I would view hyperlinks unique differentiator to be as well. Like maybe less so about the chain ID part, but I think about the more general point that like, yes, right? Like if you launch a new chain, you want interoperability, right? Like you're like, yeah, like two dudes, uh, someone Ho Chi Minh City, and right, like you need to somehow find a way to the BD arm of layer zero labs to get layer zero on your chain. And we just don't think that's very crypto, you know, like I think crypto is all about this idea of like, you don't have to ask anybody, right? Like you can just uh, go start building an application and provide value. And like, you don't have to get pesky licenses. You don't have to like talk to a human. Uh, and that's what I think we yeah want to enable basically bringing that kind of like crypto, like ethos of permissionless to interoperability. And I think, yeah, we've spent a lot of, lot of time on actually making that a reality, uh, really over the last two years. Um, and so I'm glad to see that, like, uh, what, well, how Hyperlink has trying to kind of differentiate itself has like come across to you as well. So thanks for that. Okay. So, uh, but, but this one, uh, issue that I, I worry about when using bridges built on top of, um, those messaging, um, uh, protocols is that. Uh, there's a lot of token formats, right? So if you if you bridge, um, let's say other ERC twenty tokens, uh, you bridge from one chain to another. So it, when, when when you go across the bridge, it's a new version of it. So is it a problem with Hyperlane? Because um, we we see in the past, uh, from my experience, um, as you bridge, let's say uh, Celestia T I A uh, token from Arbitrum going to um, uh, let's say Notron, so so it's it's a different format and a little uh, inconvenient for users because if they don't know what exactly that format is, they can lose the fun on that. So how can you address those problems? Yeah, I think the kind of I guess what we generally call the kind of like token representation fragmentation, it's definitely a very real user experience problem, and I think it's a you know, classic, like, lack of standardization. And so honestly, I don't know that we've, like, found, like, how to solve these kind of, like, you know, like, uh, I guess market failures or, like, lack of shelling points. But I think to come back, like, or, like, to come back to your point, this is clearly not, like, a sustainable setup for users, right? Like, they should not have to think about, like, oh, what, like, what bridge do I use to get what assets? Um, and my, I guess my view is that hopefully over time, it's going to be asset like right like today the reason why we experience this is because many of the assets that we use today do not want to basically take a stance on interoperability right um and so they like they end up letting other parties decide what is the bridge that will have the most liquidity to mint a particular asset on some particular chain and so that leads to a very like yeah fragmented user experience because it's like there's like these three different dimensions or three different uh yeah three dimensions that um kind of like impact that and i do think that asset issuers will eventually basically come to realize that this is not a good experience for asset holders and they will want to take on interoperability themselves and so like i think a great example of that is like renzo like Renzo is an LRT uh, on top of Eigenlayer and now also other uh, staking protocols. But for their kind of like main asset, Easy ETH, right? Like they realize, okay, like we we need to take an act, take an active participation in basically like what is the right Easy ETH. Um, and yes, yeah, so like we've been working with them on that. Like there's uh, you know the Renzo bridge uh, powered by Hyperlane and like, right, like everybody knows, okay, this is the bridge to use if you want to bridge like Renzo. Um, and so I expect that like increasingly like asset issuers will uh, want to take the same stance of kind of like allowing the assets to be like obviously moved by what bridge under what trust assumptions, maybe with right, like what security um, as well as like what kind of like leverage of the token economic you know like availability of their asset in the first place and so my hope is that like i think the problem that you kind of like mentioned there will get solved primarily through that okay so uh for this final part uh any alpha leaks that you can share with audience of DeFi discussion 
any any new features any updates or a uh, partnership that you can share or um, maybe uh, the type of chain that hyperland would target uh, in in the near future yeah uh, you know uh, i would say the best alpha always exists either like on chain or online right like it's not going to be the thing that people talk about but it's the thing that people do and that leave traces behind so that's one thing i think the second thing i would say is like you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast um we'll be hosting the first like hyperlane outposts in hanoi uh on uh september 10th on tuesday um so if you're in the area come check come check it out you can ask me those questions in person but yeah like really like i think the like honestly like i think github is a great uh place to see all the kind of like, activity that developers on hyperlane are doing to kind of like help it expand hyperlane either to new chains but also to like i think we call them execution environments right there's a bunch of great teams who are building like hyperlane implementation for like other execution environments um the like svm implementation is hopefully coming soon Uh, or it's, it's going to be live soon and there's some other like yeah very interesting ones um that will be launching soon as well yeah okay uh it's a really cool adventure ahead especially in welfare and really new industry right mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much for spending your time joining the discussion Uh, this week, um, I hope that a lot of audience of this podcast can feel that there's something big coming for this industry after this episode. And uh, I hope that somehow we will know more about uh, Hiveland, what are what what are they um, building, and um, know what to expect in the near future. So uh, thank you one more time. Um, uh, it's really great to have a chance to. Uh, Um, chat with you today about a very interesting topic yeah yeah of, of course yeah um yeah again thanks thanks for having me um you know it's um it's been it's been super awesome again to be back in asia and like yeah i super appreciate being able to talk to folks like you um not just about hyperlane but again just like right like how uh kind of like we can all learn to collaborate with each other to kind of like yeah, move this industry forward And so, yeah, like if anybody has any ideas or just wants to chat, feel free to reach out to me on uh, X or slash Twitter, uh, Nambrot, N-A-M-B-R-O-T. Like I mentioned, the event on Tuesday, you can find the link to it on uh, our Twitter as well, at Hyperlane. Yeah. And yeah, like, um, thanks for having us. Yeah. One more time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for uh, enjoying this podcast with us this week. So uh, hopefully we will see each other again next week on uh, this podcast.